All right, well, I guess I can get started on my presentation. Um, before I pull that up, I thought I'd just say a few words. Um, first, I just want to thank the uh, uh, Army Heritage and Education Center for hosting the summer virtual programs. Um, and this is part of the uh, Diversity Weekend. I'm very thankful for the opportunity to speak about my uh, family's history, as well as my connection with, with uh, AHEC. Um, in the past, I was actually an intern with them, and I also worked for them for a summer. Um, but my name is Jordan Kojima. I studied history at the Queen's University of Charlotte for my undergraduate, and I studied at University of North Carolina at Charlotte uh, for my master's program. Uh, I studied uh, Japanese American history in both, uh, in both programs. Um, and while I'm interested in other parts of history, uh, this uh, this part of history is very near and dear to me because of uh, my family connection and my personal connection. So I'm excited to share a little bit, a little bit of that with you today. Um, so without further ado, um, I'll, I guess I'll dive right into my presentation for everybody. Okay, sorry, I just want to make sure my presentation's up. Um, so today I'm just talking about my great uncle. His name is Tadashi Kojima as well as the 100th Battalion and the 442nd uh, Regimental Combat Team. Uh, they were a, a unit of all uh, Japanese Americans who uh, fought during World War II and uh, <clears throat> uh, made a, a very big significant effort for uh, Japanese Americans. Um, before I get started on the actual military service, as well as uh, my uncle, um, something important is <clears throat> my uncle was born and raised in Hawaii. Um, something very interesting and very different um, is that Hawaii that we know today is a very urbanized. There's a lot of resorts um, there's a lot of beaches. And we think of Hawaii as you know, very modern in, in a certain sense. And if you go back to right before the, even the World Wars, um, Hawaii was mainly agriculture. It was very much a backwater. Uh, besides the plantations and the agriculture, uh, it was really the military base. <clears throat> so uh, a lot of people ended up immigrating to Hawaii during the decades before World War II. Uh, my family was one of them. Uh, <clears throat> you had probably about a 30% population uh, percentage of Japanese, 30% maybe Korean and 30% Chinese. And it all varied, obviously. But uh, you had a lot of Asians there. Um, there was obviously mil people from military bases as well. Um, but the population was <clears throat> uh, mainly Asian. So one of the interesting parts, if you just look at some of these pictures I've, I've pulled up today, and I just want to thank Hawaii State Archives. They have a lot of really interesting pictures. Uh, some of these pictures are older than World War II. Um, some of them are uh, a little bit probably closer to the around 1900, but uh, <clears throat> The pictures do show what the plantations looked like. Um, just pretty much all of the land you see in these pictures are probably either developed or neighborhoods now. Um, there's actually no, I don't believe there's any active uh, plantations on the, uh, <clears throat> on the Oahu, I believe. <clears throat> there might be a plantation or two on other islands, but I can't remember. But <clears throat> so Hawaii was mainly agriculture at this time. And, um, <clears throat> something interesting too is that um, the plantations were often broken down into uh, <clears throat> into excuse me into uh, different communities. So my family was in the Japanese community. There was a Korean neighborhood, and then there was also a Chinese neighborhood. Um, this was definitely not what we think of maybe like a suburban neighborhood. This was very much plantation, or if you've ever been to a a mining town, kind of that kind of feel, very much. Kind of wooden shacks, bare bones, not much there. I mean, here's just some pictures of that. Um, I believe that house is again a little bit before World War II, but that's just to give you kind of a feel of how kind of rustic it was back then in Hawaii. Um, it was very much just a wooden building with uh, no running water and no electricity, uh, dirt floors, uh, very simple living for sure. And <clears throat> you know, men just worked in the field all day. And that was, that was just the life that people had. Um, 
but my family was on one of those plantations. Um, <clears throat> they lived and worked, um, it's called the, uh, I believe it's the pronunciation is the Papaloa Plantation in Eva, Hawaii. Um, <clears throat> so there were eight kids in our family, or eight kids on my grandparents' generation, and they were all crammed in pretty much a one or kind of one and a half room uh, plantation house. Um, <clears throat> and as part of that, Tadashi Kojima, my great uncle, is the eldest of those eight. Uh, my grandfather, Takashi Kojima, is the youngest. So <clears throat> growing up, I, my grandfather never knew my uh, great uncle because uh, there was such a big age difference. Um, I believe at the time of the wars, my grandfather was maybe <clears throat> close to 10, uh, maybe 12. And my uh, great uncle was actually 24. So <clears throat> there's a very big age difference there. And they didn't, they were never close. And I, I didn't hear many stories since I came from the younger branch of the family. <clears throat> so one of the interesting parts of my great uncle's story here that we're going to start with today and the, his enlistment in the U.S. Army was in March of 41. <clears throat> now, the date significant is that it predates the organization of the 442 as well as the 100th Battalion. So <clears throat> before those were even units, uh, my uh, great uncle had enlisted in Hawaii um, and he helped serve on the base there, I believe. Um, <clears throat> so and it was very interesting because there was a lot of tension at the time. Obviously, there was before the war, Japan and America had some different incidences in Korea, or not Korea, excuse me, China, and <clears throat> as well as the South Pacific, there have been a few incidents. And there was some tension there, <clears throat> for sure. Um, but in Hawaii, it was a very different kind of tension because, again, probably almost a third of the population there at the time was Japanese or Japanese descendants. So, um, but my uncle was in the army before Pearl Harbor, um, which is leads me to the next part of the presentation is Hawaii. Um, for those of you who've been lucky enough to go to Hawaii, um, it's very beautiful. I recommend you go if you get the opportunity. Um, but here's a map. Uh, the star at the bottom right is the, excuse me, is the uh, uh, Honolulu area. It's, it's much bigger now. Honolulu kind of takes up a, a whole, the whole east, southeast part of that strip. Um, but the big circle that I put on that map of Oahu is uh, per the Pearl Harbor region. Um, that's where the dry docks, that's also where the, you know, the harbors were for all the famous battleships. All the pictures you've seen, or maybe if you've been lucky to see the, the burning ships in the harbor, all of that takes place there. Um, so if you do get a chance to go to Hawaii, I do recommend going to see Pearl Harbor. It is a very uh, interesting museum and interesting monument. Um, the little star, the little diamond I put is where the Eva plantation area is, or where it used to be. Um, there is a community there now, kind of a neighborhood, but it, the plantation has been long since demolished. But um, that's where my family was, at least my dad's family. Um, my, my maternal, my, sorry, my paternal grandmother, um, she, her family was on a different plantation, I believe, um, just up the road. And so this part of this whole story is my family was close enough to see Pearl Harbor attack. A lot of my older, a lot of people in that generation, my grandparents' generation, can remember seeing the planes coming overhead. They remember seeing the smoke um, from the harbor. And so one of my great uncles uh, remembers actually a, a, mil a U.S. military personnel coming into their plantation community and telling everyone to stay inside and to not come out. Um, so it's really interesting and it's, it's really, it's interesting to have a personal connection to that event because it is often discussed in the American history books. Um, but finding out your, your family was present or at least witnessed part of it, um, is just, I guess, one of the things that makes history interesting to me. It's, uh, very much a significant event and it's, uh, important, I think. Um, but moving on from that part, we have um, just a timeline of World War II. So December 7th, 1941 is Pearl Harbor. And after that point, I'm kind of just giving some bullet points of significant events that happened. So um, Executive Nine, uh, 
excuse me, Executive Order 9066 um, is where the internment camps were formed. Um, President FDR signed an executive order for the military, for the, uh, the Western uh, home front for, for the U.S. Army to relocate all persons of Japanese descent away from the West Coast. Um, so Hawaii was not included in that because there were too many Japanese in Hawaii and it wasn't logistically feasible. Um, but Hawaii was kept under martial law because it was a territory. Um, so it was still wartime footing. But my mom's side of the family, um, and my mom is also a Japanese American, and her side of the family was in California. And so that part of the family actually got moved to the interior of America. Um, to my One of the camps was in Arkansas, and the other camp was in California, or uh, kind of towards the Nevada, California border. But <clears throat> during that whole internment process, uh, the Japanese American community was given three, roughly three days to pack up all belongings they could carry and to report to a staging center to be moved away. Um, so there are, <clears throat> and while this presentation doesn't cover internment in depth, um, I do encourage you to look into it a little bit. Um, my, for example, my great grandfather had a grocery store and he had to sell that store for five dollars because um, he only had five, he only had a few days to sell it, and the person who was buying it from him knew he had to get rid of it. Um, and a lot of people left their homes with neighbors or their farms. Um, some people were lucky at the end of the war that they managed to keep it, but a lot of people weren't so fortunate. Um, and kind of getting now into the actual military side of things. Um, so before the war, as I mentioned, my uncle was um, enlisted in Hawaii and the early recruits there, the Japanese there in Hawaii were enough to form a battalion. And they activated this 100th battalion under a different name, it eventually became the 100th. But what would become the 100th battalion was activated in September of 42. And it was sent to the mainland to Camp Shelby, Mississippi to begin training. Um, around the same time, the, uh, uh, the US Army was starting a recruitment of Japanese Americans in the internment camps. Um, it didn't go very well, because obviously you've just moved a bunch of people from their homes. Not many people are really gonna be willing to fight immediately. And as a result, they had to expand the recruitment to hold back to Hawaii. And so they went back to Hawaii and got more recruits. And then they brought them into the Camp Shelby, Mississippi to start training. But because of this whole delayed timeline <clears throat> is where is why you see there's this 100th Battalion group and then there's this 442 group. Um, it all is one group, but there's kind of two separate groups in the beginning. Um, so as, as my notes have said there, the 100th Battalion was sent to Camp Shelby, Mississippi, and then eventually the 442 recruits arrive in mid to late 43. And so there's already uh, things going on and um, the unit's beginning to <clears throat> get formed in that kind of middle of 43. Um, here's just a quick pictures though about some internment camps. These are uh, just some pictures take from the National Archives. Um, these are very common. I've seen, you might've seen them before on news or programs or documentaries. Um, so there's a picture on the right of a lot of the Japanese Americans being loaded onto trains and they would be sent to the camps and they were dropped off. Um, these camps, what they call camps, they, a lot of these were just either hastily created army barrack style camps in the middle of a desert or in the middle of a remote area. Um, some of them like Topaz was actually a racetrack at one point that they just put barbed wire around. And so, <clears throat> Ironically, the military found out how logistically difficult it is to feed and house 120,000 people in remote areas. And so there, there's one of the actually, so by the time the camps get up and running, the military does not want to run them. So <clears throat> there's a whole internal politics in the government of trying to decommission them. And uh, that's another story in and of itself. But the internment camp life was difficult in a lot of ways, um, interesting in a lot of ways. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's part of our, my community, my ethnic, ethnicity's history. But um, for, at least for today's discussion, I'm talking about my 
dad's side and they weren't uh, in the camp. So but I thought it would be at least good for you to see a, few, a couple of pictures about it uh, and get an idea. Um, and then here's just a couple of pictures of the 100th Battalion and the 442 in their training. Um, those are some, again, some pictures from the US Army Signal Corps. Um, for those of you who are doing research projects, I do recommend you looking at the National Archive. The US Army Signal Corps is a, uh, a good resource um, because it is a government, uh, I guess apparatus might be the word, or organization. Uh, the photos are public domain. So I do recommend you looking if you're looking for interesting Army pictures or you just want to do some research on your own. So on the left side of that screen, um, they're doing some training drills um, with, a, I believe that's a pond or a river. And then on the right, that's just the men in the uniform uh, standing together for a photo. Um, <clears throat> so, but as part of this unit, they eventually do get sent um, over to Italy. So it was decided that the Japanese American fighting unit would not be deployed to the Pacific very early on. And they decided to send it to Italy. So, because the 100th Battalion, which my great uncle was part of, um, they're from Hawaii, they'd already been through enlistment, had gone through training in late 42, early 43, they were deployed pretty quickly, relatively speaking. So they left for Italy in August, uh, July, August of 43. Um, and so this, the 100th Battalion was just a few thousand men. Um, they were already, they, since they were ready and they needed bodies, they were sent off first. The 442nd, the regimental combat team, remained in Camp Shelby, finished training, and wouldn't be deployed, or wouldn't finish training until early 44. And then it took them a little bit of time to get over to Italy as well. So, but between those two time frames, the 100th Battalion, and this is where some of the naming gets confusing, uh, is the 100th Battalion distinguished itself in service. And the army isn't going to decommission a name if it's been distinguished. And so as a result, the 100th Battalion was allowed to keep its designation and they just put the names together. Um, and when I started my own military uh, research and, and the whole into the unit, it always confused me why there was two designations. Um, and it took me a little bit to figure that out because it does take some understanding of the way the military operates. but. That is why it's usually a long name, the 100th Battalion, 442nd Regimental Combat Team. Um, it is not a short name by any stretch of the imagination. But if you do refer to the 442nd, the 100th Battalion is part of it. Um, so, but the 100th Battalion actually fought at Monte Cassino. Um, it was a very famous mountain battle in Italy. Um, if you want to look it up, that's part of it. It was also part of the liberation of Rome. Um, and then the 442nd arrived roughly after the liberation of Rome in June, um, and they arrived in Anzio and they started to help with the Northern campaign in Italy. Um, and that's when they recombined into one unit. So my uh, great uncle was uh, part of that recombination because um, he was part of the 100th and he eventually was put back into the 442. Um, just to kind of go through some highlights of the battles that they fought, um, the 442nd was distinguished itself between 44 and 45 in a lot of significant ways. I'm just going to, at least for right now, I'm just going to talk about a couple of the short battles. Um, it was again mainly fighting in Italy and southern France. It did fight a little bit over the German border, but the war ended um, around that time. Uh, the most famous um, scenario or the incident that the 442 was uh, involved in was the rescue of the Lost, uh, Lost Battalion. <clears throat> so in France, there was, they were fighting in the mountains and um, a Tex, I believe it was called the, the Texas Division or the Texas, part of the Texas Division. I can't remember the number right now, but um, was cut off. There was a German counterattack in the mountains and it got uh, isolated. <clears throat> there was really no way to rescue it with the airdrops. And there was a lot of German resistance because it was the mountains. And so the 442 was given the task of uh, cutting through the German lines and reconnecting. Um, and it became a very significant part of the unit's history because uh, during that battle, um, there was significant casualties. A lot of men were killed. Um, uh, there's stories, for example, of uh, 
one of the companies, a company is roughly, I believe it's a hundred men, but a, a company, <clears throat> one of the companies lost, I believe 80 to 90% of its men, but the 442nd uh, ended up fighting and they did a lot of, you know, very courageous things. Um, they were charging German lines, all, the, all that sort of thing. And they eventually rescued the lost battalion. And they also, during that whole campaign, liberated a few French towns. Um, just a fun story that's one of my favorites uh, is when they liberated, there's two French cities, uh, or, or sorry, towns in the mountains. One's called Bruyere and the other one's, I think it's called Bifontaine. It's the French pronunciation maybe. But uh, there's interesting stories that uh, when these Japanese Americans walked into the city, the uh, French people who have never obviously probably been outside the French countryside uh, have never seen an Asian person maybe in, li in, real, per in real life or let alone a Japanese person. And um, these, these boys who grew up in Hawaii who are very American in a lot of ways, you know, are walking down their streets. They're just really confused what was going on. Um, <clears throat> and they would ask them like, where are you from? Like, are you Americans? It's just this really interesting encounters. But those cities actually had monuments built to the to the unit for liberating their city or their towns. And um, I believe at one point there was kind of a, uh, what do you call it, a uh, relationship between the two cities, between Honolulu and those two cities. So it's kind of just a fun part of how history connects to today. But um, it's always just a funny picture in my mind of, um, you know, these Japanese Americans from Hawaii of all places walking down a French town street and their French people are asking, you know, who are these people? <laughs> like, would, I've never seen you before. And it's, uh, it's just a fun part of, uh, you know, that cultural, uh, cultural mixing there. Um, <clears throat> so here's just really quick uh, ending part of kind of the awards and the honors that the 442nd had. Um, uh, about 18,000 men served. Um, that number varies depending who's counting, but it's about 18,000. Um, they have, did have a combat casualty rate of over, it, they say 300% because a lot of people were injured. The, the way they're counting that is how many men had to be taken out of the unit and then re, kind of re, re, replenished, excuse me. So there was, they had to replenish the unit about 300%, which is where it comes from. Um, the Medals of Honor are a significant part of its history. Um, and actually, a lot of those Medals of Honor were not awarded during the war. They're um, honored or uh, upgraded, I should say, um, after the fact, a few decades after the fact, I believe it was the Reagan administration or the Clinton administration is the one that upgraded those to Medals of Honor. Um, there were a lot of Distinguished Service Crosses as well. And I've given some um, other uh, numbers for some other uh, medals and honors. Um, and I'm really not trying to sit there and just say like, sh to use the numbers to show you how great they are, but just to show you how, uh, how much these men sacrificed, how much these men uh, really put on the line for their country here. Um, it was nicknamed in a lot of ways, the Purple Heart Battalion, because it, a lot of the men were injured. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of men were killed too as well. And you also receive a Purple Heart in that scenario too. But um, in that sense, the 442 for the, a unit of its size and the unit of its service length is one of the most decorated units in uh, US Army history. Um, so it is really interesting. And, and um, it's something very proud as far as being part of the Japanese American community. It's very much something the group has always been proud of, um, that the men um, sacrificed a lot and, um, were recognized for that by the U.S. Army, and so there's a there's so many stories, so many war stories that could be told about those those uh, battles, those efforts. Um, but I just thought at least give you a, a general overview today of, of some of those awards and honors. Uh, and just wrapping up about the last of the wartime service, and um, this is one of my favorite pictures. Um, it's uh, President Truman. So this is about 45, 46. Um, and the uh, 442 is at, uh, as uh, all together for this really great picture. Um, and it's just really proud. It's a really proud moment for the Japanese American community because 
uh, during the war, it was very difficult. It was very shameful to be part to be a Japanese American during the whole war because uh, we belong to the ethnicity that America was fighting. Um, and there was a lot of, you know, racism towards that. Um, if you really want, if you want to look it up, a lot of uh, stores in America back then were still allowed to say like, uh, you know, no Japs wanted. Japs is kind of the derogatory uh, name giving, if you want to be derogatory to a Japanese person, Japs is kind of derogatory. <laughs> Japs is one of the most popular. But there's signs that you can see um, if you look in the history books of like just these huge signs that say no Japs wanted or, you know, some restaurants or services would deny Japanese service because of that as well. And so this unit very much after the war was something the community could be proud of and something the community could rally behind. And it's um, in a very important part of our history. And I encourage you to definitely look in more into some of the service and their sacrifice. Um, I've really kind of just given you the, the 10,000 foot view, but Part of this presentation that might be kind of conspicuous at this point is that I have not talked about my great uncle a whole lot. And the reason for that is he was uh, killed in action on July 14th of 44, which is before a lot of the events that I would just spoke about. Um, he was killed in Italy um, in a skirmish in some of the mountain fighting. Uh, and so in reality, I don't know a lot about the man. Uh, he, uh, he was the oldest brother, so my grandfather never knew him, or if he did know him, he doesn't have many memories. And um, he died, you know, very young. Um, so a lot of his brothers didn't really know him very well. Um, my family did continue to live on the plantation for the rest of their lives. Some of them did eventually move off and start their own jobs and move away. But um, my great grandfather um, used the compensation money from the army to actually buy a, a chicken coop. I'm gonna use that to uh, make some extra money for the family. But, and it, it might seem weird that I'm telling this story, you might be asking why the story is so significant besides the fact that I'm ethnically part of the group but just that my, it's, it doesn't seem to be a very strong connection um, between me and my great uncle. And from a relationship standpoint, that is correct. But uh, when, I was, when I was 12, about 12, maybe 13, I had just watched my first World War II documentary. Uh, for those of you who might remember when the History Channel would always put on those, uh, you know, very, uh, very kind of general World War II documentaries on, on, the, sh on the channel. Um, I was just really interested by the, the video, the footage, the history. Um, I had no idea about, you know, the, I didn't have any sense of geography or time at that time in my life, but just the images, you know, caught my imagination. And I was really curious, you know, what was this big war that a lot of people fought and died in as a, as a 13 year old? And one day I was watching one of those documentaries and my dad walked in and he's like, oh, you know, you had a, a great uncle that served in World War II. And then so, and then my mom, and so suddenly there, and just, I remember that moment very clearly because I looked at the TV and I looked at him and I said like, really? Like the, I, I know someone I know or someone related to me was, not in the TV, but you know, in the in that footage, or in that world that the footage was taken, and he's like, "Yeah, you know, the <clears throat> your great uncle served, and but I, I don't know anything about it." And so that was actually one of the, it was the one of the, actually the main reason I became a historian. Um, I was so interested and so intrigued by this family connection to this time I didn't understand to this war I didn't fully understand at the time and I started my whole history career and founded my whole history studies through that one through that one experience and I would encourage I well, obviously I encourage anyone who's interested in their family history and, and um, 
interested in their the army history to to use those resources and, and look for those answers but um i i started from that point from 13 i guess until even today i'm still doing research on and off about different things that interest me with the family um but as far as these pictures these are actually my personal pictures um and in 20 uh, 16, the end of 2016, I was blessed uh, to uh, take a vacation to Hawaii, and we were able to go up to, um, it's called the Punch Bowl, it's a, it's a veterans cemetery up in the, in the, on a, on a mountaintop, or hilltop, and uh, that's where actually a lot of my great aunts and uncles, my, a lot of my great uncles served, and my grandfather served in Korea, so they're all kind of buried up there, so when we went, um, I went and took pictures of all the all the graves and got to visit them, but this was the one I was very much I, I had to see, um, and it was kind of surreal because um, I had spent at that point in time in my life probably 14, 13 or fourteen years uh, studying Japanese American history, studying my family history, uh, learning about World War II, learning about my great uncle, and to actually have the opportunity to see his grave and to take a picture of it, to stand by it. It was very much a bookend in, in some sense. It was kind of, it was very surreal. And it's one of the, you know, the memories I, I definitely treasure from that trip. But I also want to encourage you as far as to look into that famous family histories. And honestly, the Army Heritage and Education Center is a great place to do that. Um, again, I was an intern there and I've worked there before. Um, and uh, the people there love history. They love the army history as well. And I just, go, this is the personal gratification and the uh, personal um, journey that I went on to discover all this about my family. I, and AHEC is an organization that can help out with that too. And so I'd encourage you to, you know, use their resources and um, use that opportunity. Uh, they, it's, Learning about your family's history is, is never easy sometimes. It's not always pretty, but it is definitely, I think, worth it. So, um, but as far as my presentation today, that is um, all I prepared for the educational side of things. I thought we could just go to a general Q&A and I can dive into more specific things if you have any questions. But I, um, I do want to thank the uh, uh, Army Heritage Education Center for uh, hosting me today and uh, having me on for their event.